Yes, thank you. How we track asteroids. I know you're going to say it's non-trivial, but um, <laughs> let's start with you, Alan, because I know you work on pan stars, which uh -huh. I visited, actually. So you talk a bit about how pan stars works. Well, pan stars works the same way that the ancient Greeks discovered the planets over 2,000 years ago. When we look up in the sky, we see stars and galaxies, but they're all fixed relative in position or in relative positions to one another. Whereas anything moving around our sun, in orbit about our sun, will move against those background stars and galaxies. And that's how search telescopes work, trying to find asteroids, comets, and of course near-Earth asteroids. And so what we're looking for is a moving dot of light, and it will be just a dot of light that appears just like another star, but it will slowly over hours and from night to night move against the background of those stars. The rate at which it moves gives us some initial indication whether or not it's close to us or far away. But it takes generally several nights to establish at least a, an initial orbit or path around the sun and thereby be able to find out whether or not it's coming anywhere near our planet. You know, I was just talking earlier to, to Ed, who has a a way of doing that when you can't actually see them, which is a quite <laughs> remarkable thing. So you describe that. Yeah, we're looking for the very smallest of asteroids, ones that can't, that, that are not the types of ones that you would find at more of the tr traditional telescopes, but ones which are small and therefore close to the telescope and therefore moving very fast. Mm -hmm. Now, these ones are dim enough that they're actually quite a bit dimmer than the background sky. So the question is, how do you see something that's moving really fast? You can't take a longer exposure because they move. So what we're doing is we're making up for the fact that uh, uh, we have small telescopes by taking, uh, we, we take very long exposures and we compensate for the motion. But because we don't know where the asteroids are or where they're moving, or actually there are, will be many in the field of view at any given time, we will actually use very fast graphics processing to try every possible combination for where those asteroids are and where they're going and digitally move our camera to follow the asteroids not knowing ahead of time where they are, and then search for them that way. I find that almost unbelievable, that if you think about it, that you can start not being able to see anything at all and just keep drawing lines, essentially. Is that what you do? That's you, essentially you what you're it. doing. And the amount of graphics processing it takes to do that is something that would have been unheard of even five years ago. But now it's actually to the point where it's actually relatively cheap. So uh, B612 Foundation, together with its uh, collaborators at Caltech and JPL, have built and tested such a system, and we're planning to launch a system into Earth orbit to test the technology for finding and tracking asteroids smaller than 100 meters. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, now, Mark, I know you work on the NeoCam. Um, project. Uh, yes, I'm a member of the NEOCAM team. It's headed by my colleague Amy Meinzer from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's, uh, it's in the project stage. It's the development of an infrared telescope, so it, instead of measuring light, it measures heat, and it's got a very wide field camera, but what makes it really special is it's in space. Um, so it, when it's launched, it will be at what's called the L1 Lagrange point, which is one and a half million um, uh, kilometers toward the sun and it will be looking away from the sun and it's really got multiple goals. One is to um, uh, help determine the positions of asteroids, discover asteroids for risk, so to protect um, the earth as part of planetary defense. It also does science um, to learn about origins and fates of asteroids and finally to potentially find targets for uh, space, uh, uh, space probes and even human exploration. But what's really good about infrared is that you can find even very small asteroids uh, because you're looking at heat and in, in that wavelength, they're much brighter. They're much warmer. Even though they're not hot, they're much warmer than the space behind them. So they really stand out and they're, they, they're much easier to discover. I've just heard actually that one of the one of the great um, founders and, and proponents of Asteroid Day, Brian May, has just woken up. I think he's in California or something, and he sent us a tweet. So, um, what has Brian tweeted? Yes, we do. We have a tweet from uh, Brian May. Um, he says, in, in great big friendly capital letters, Happy Asteroid Day. Um, it's Asteroid Day today, and we hope you'll be part of the global dot, dot, dot. It's a bit of a cliffhanger, that tweet. But if you go to his Instagram page, um, you'll see the whole message. 
Well, thank you. Well, we'll be back to you when we find out what he was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be soon. Um, Mario, we, we've talked about um, uh, space-based telescopes and uh, so, so ground-based telescopes. Um, you, you're um, working on the LSST now, yeah. which is a big project. Yeah, so the, the LSST stands for a Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, uh, and it uh, kind of falls in the footsteps of PanSTARS. It's a project to build the largest optical survey of the sky ever. Um, it's going to be an 8-meter class telescope uh, in the Chilean Andes uh, with the largest astronomical camera ever, 3.2 gigapixels. That's 1,500 HD TVs if you wanted to actually project that yeah. image in a native resolution. And one of the things that um, that telescope is going to do is essentially it's going to search the entire sky every three nights. And it's going to be creating a database of that sky. I think of it as a search engine for the sky. Um, once you start imaging the entire sky uh, repeatedly, then that data set becomes interesting to all kinds of science cases, um, from dark energy to asteroids. When, when it comes to asteroids, we're going to be seeing about a million asteroids every night. We're going to be discovering about five million asteroids or so by the time uh, LSST is completed. Um, and we expect to, to find something like you know, two thirds to three quarters of, of uh, large-ish NEOs that might be uh, a problem to Earth. In terms of, um, Frank, I want to talk to you about uh, your astrofactums in the commercial sector. Yes, yeah, so we are a new space company and we are based on two columns, if you like. Uh, if you have the Astro Cloud, which is the only cloud astronomers actually do like, and then <laughs> uh, the Public Telescope, which is a satellite-based telescope for everybody. So, yeah. uh, and it combines more or less what we heard here already, but targeting more uh, also the private astronomers, uh, as well as commercial companies like Blue Horizon, or companies who cannot afford to lose any observation time due to weather conditions, because on a satellite-based uh, telescope, you, you're not affected by this, right? So, so uh, how powerful, what, what sort of telescope would that be that you could imagine with your business model being able to support? It's obviously not the Hubble. <laughs> no, it's not as big as the Hubble, right? Um, but it should follow the Hubble gap, if you like. So we focus on the uh, ultraviolet uh, spectrum and in a combination with the cloud where we can share and upload uh, data from everybody, so every private astronomer who makes uh, interesting data, um, we can use this data now and share it to everybody who's interested in, in an open science project. So it's a combination of open science and commercial services we offer to, to companies. Gianluca, that, that's um, it's going to be an exciting thing for, for amateurs as well as, as, as companies, the idea that you get access to more and more sophisticated instruments. I mean, how important is it still? We've discussed it a little bit before, but how important is it still for, or what contribution can amateurs make? Well, this is a, a truly important topic, Brian, because we see we are really happy to welcome this big telescope. So we really expect to increase a lot the discovery rate. And this is, this is good. This is one of the dreams of the asteroid day movement, you know. But the, I mean, the next night, what happens to all those discoveries, you know? OK, th these telescopes likely will cover them, OK, because they will continue scanning the skies. But having people just looking up there every night, just going to look for those asteroids, risking to be to go lost, you know, this is good. So there are people doing this on a nightly basis for just for hobby, you know. But they are, OK, now suffering a bit because the bigger the telescopes, the fainter the targets. And this is a problem for the amateur community. But they are still really working a lot. And you can see this every day on the Minor Planet Center circulars. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, uh, amateur astronomers have contributed to this field so much, I think more than to any other field in astronomy. Right. But what, what I think, that, that, what, what you're saying is, a, is, is, is true and, and kind of can be thought of as danger to amateur astronomers because of these bigger and bigger telescopes. But where I think the opportunity is, is as, as Ed mentioned, these, all these new surveys depend on software and clever algorithms now to find right. asteroids. And, and I think we're, we're seeing an opportunity here for a new kind of amateur astronomer, the one who doesn't even have a telescope, mm -hmm. but who may be a computer scientist or a computer engineer who can come up with these next generation surveys. I, I keep saying that we, we may have um, built big telescope, but we haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to software. I think that's where today's astronomers can I, I must really say that I, I'm really impressed yeah. to see also today what they can really do with small telescopes, just, just fine-tuning the hardware, the software mm -hmm. as well. So yeah. something that 
20 years ago was simply impossible to dream yeah. to me. Yeah. Especially in the combination, right? If you have so many private astronomers, you're right. Right? You can share it you're on right. this astro cloud to everybody who's interested in universities, private researchers. Yes. Right? And I agree, this is an area just showing so brightly the, I mean, the power, the benefit of this really s strong cooperation yeah. really yeah. shines. It's important to mention that it's not just discovering the, the asteroids, you must track them. Right. Yeah. And to track them, you need to track them accurately, you mean, which means you need to follow them over some yeah. period of time. So it's actually worthless to just say I've discovered it if you don't have a track on it, because that means that the next time, it's just like discovering it again the next time you see it because I don't realize it's the same asteroid I saw earlier if I hadn't tracked it. And then beyond the tracking, there's characterization, right? And exactly. You want to collect data on it. You want to get spectra and you want to get light curves and other information, albedo. So the, the, the multiple observations are critical to building the database, the, the, the map of the solar system uh, of where all these things are. You need to accurately measure their trajectories, and then from there you can go on to measuring their properties. You know, what are they made of? How big are they? Things like that. Um, but that all takes multiple observations. And how does that work, Alan? I, I just want to, you know, just, uh, we have to point out that it's going tremendously well at the moment. This, this synergy between the professional big scopes and the smaller scopes sometimes used by amateur astronomers in the tracking and the follow-up means that at the moment we get over 1,800 new near-Earth asteroids every year. I mean, I, I checked my email this lunchtime before, before we started, and there were another uh, seven or eight announced yesterday uh, mm -hmm. by the Minor Planet Center, uh, where they were discovered initially, as you say, by the big scopes, and they uh, were then followed up by a combination of professional and amateur astronomers. And if you look, at, if you listen to what's been said around today about the, the advances in processing, uh, the, the potential new facilities coming online, that I mean the future is really good for finding these objects. But it's not enough just to characterise the orbit once, is it? Because they interact and they move, and so, so we, we've got to have some uh, cross check on the orbits, particularly of the Earth-crossing asteroids. Oh, oh absolutely, because of course we know that uh, all the asteroid orbits never stay the same. They're continues being tugged by the gravitational pull of the planets, quite often Jupiter, uh, but often, as you say, if they come close to our planet or perhaps Venus or Mars, they will suffer a, a gravitational perturbation there. And so it's important that we keep that online, and although that can be calculated, uh, you need those observations as the ground truth. Yeah, you lose accuracy whenever one of these encounters happens, and you need to tune it back up. Yeah. And that's the key to predicting if one of these things is going to hit the Earth, or if you want to later make, fly a mission to it, you need an update on its position. Mm -hmm. yes, I would like also to add that another field where amateur astronomers can really do a lot is some kind of physical characterization, you know. You can really do a lot of photometry, even with small telescopes. Oh, yeah. I'm impressed that every time I see less than one meter large telescopes really doing mm. Amazing photometry, just revealing mm -hmm. the shape of this object, and this can really help mm -hmm. the big telescopes mm -hmm. and all the other projects to learn more. But it's, it's not just the, the shape, it's the fact that by knowing exactly how they're spinning, yeah. if you've got an object that you are concerned mm -hmm. about, if you're going to send a mission to that asteroid or planning a mission even to that asteroid, knowing its spin vector, knowing how it's rotating, even if it's tumbling or not, really influences your spacecraft mission design, what you're going to be able to do when you get there. So these are very exciting times as well for the amateur yeah. people, you know. And it's getting better fast, too. <laughs> Not only has it, things been improving, it, they're going to continue to improve over the next yeah. several I was years. going to connect to what you said. Um, one of the things with, with these bigger and bigger telescopes that we're putting online is we're going to be finding more and more asteroids, and we're going to be finding more and more interesting things to go and follow up. There aren't enough telescopes on Earth to, to, to go follow up everything. And I think any help we can get, um, especially from amateur astronomers, is going to be even more important in the next decade than it was before. So there's actually more for amateurs to do now. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. 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 so Remember that what an amateur sure. can do today <laughs> is what a professional could do 20 years That's ago. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so That's why this open science aspect is also quite interesting, right? So mm -hmm. having access to this data, Right, yeah. for, for everybody, that is the cool stuff great. here. I, as for the technology, I remember when we uh, recovered Comet Halley, at the time it was faint for the, those times, but now it will be an easy target for 
I mean, uh, backyard telescope, basically, just mm -hmm. to say you how the technology behind the telescope is really helping these people doing great things, you know. So, so we have a, a big database mm -hmm. of asteroid orbits. So how is that followed up in the professional community? Do you flag particular asteroids that may be of concern and continually observe those? That's right. I mean, the, the actual databases are updated once every 24 hours, and there are multiple copies done by multiple people to make to, as a kind of a quality control or cross-check. Uh, but then there are publicly uh, produced uh, or publicly accessible w uh, web pages. We call them risk pages because if something has a non-zero uh, probability of hitting the Earth sometime in the next 100 years, no matter how small, we put it up there. And it's not just for public consumption, of course, it's for the astronomers and space mission uh, designers' uh, consumption as well to see what have we got to think about uh, coming up in the next 10 years, 20 years, 100 years. Where do we need to make our observations, uh, our, our focused observations, uh, to have the, the greatest effect on reducing this risk? But Brian, the, the, the asteroid orbits are not continuously updated because for large periods of time, these things are too far away from any telescope to be observed. Yeah. So typically what happens, you'll observe them when they get close enough to, to the Earth, and then, then for some period of time, they're, they're far away from the Earth or on the other side of the sun and so on. So you just have to rely upon your predicted track, mm -hmm. and you have to wait till it comes around again, and then you can hope to pick it up and then refine it again. So that's a, a systematic process. We, yes. we, we wait and watch. Yeah. And see yeah. if the asteroid so goes through a particular path. So you have to have a good enough track in order to recognize it the next time it comes back that it's that it's to be identified with this one, and then these two are parts of the same track. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing to me there is also that sometimes you're looking for a non-detection as well. If you find an asteroid that's potentially dangerous to Earth, but you've you've lost it because it's too far, you may want to look at the area of the sky where it will be if it truly is dangerous to Earth. And if you don't see it, then it's actually good. That's good news. Yeah, yeah that's right. They call those virtual impactors. So there's actually more, more time, uh, a lot of time now spent on uh, observing virtual impactors and hoping not to see an yeah. asteroid there. <laughs> when you are happy, when you see nothing, you know. That's excellent. Yeah, I don't think we've, uh, we've got about 30 seconds left, but I don't think anyone's mentioned today how many asteroids of, of concern there are in our database, if any. And well, they're, they're, as we said, there are these risk pages, and, and, and it depends how far down towards zero probability you go. Uh, how, how, but concerned you <laughs> how concerned you are. <laughs> Let me just put it this way. Right? That's right. Yeah. Let me put it this way. That, I mean, at the moment, there's no asteroid on the risk pages that is definitely going to hit us in the next 100 years. I'm afraid we all still have to go to work on Monday morning. We should yeah. still pay in our pension but, but, funds. But we but. should point out that the number of asteroids thus catalogued and, and tracked is perhaps 1% of those larger than, say, Tunguska, the mm -hmm. one in, that struck in 1908. So the fact that there are none of concern doesn't mean that there are none out there. It just means that we've only tracked about 1% of them. Yeah. 1%? Yeah. So we'll wait for LSST and Neocam and the new <laughs> GPU <laughs> software, and then that number is really going to start climbing. Okay. So just well, a few years from now. Thank you very much again and it's probably over to Sabinia but I get it wrong this time you're right Brian yeah. it is over to Sabinia thank you and I'm gonna go over to Astro Day in Spain to Joseph Rodriguez who we spoke to earlier while Jean Luca is transitioning back to his place again to talk more about surveys and asteroids today so Joseph how are you doing what's happening over in Spain hi thank you just uh, happy to be here again and uh, well, waiting for, for questions probably from the audience. Mm. We, don't, we don't have any questions at the moment, but, but I was thinking, um, you spoke earlier about your laboratory experiments of the physical properties. How far have you come in that? And didn't you also show us the book? Oh, yes, exactly. Uh, we have been uh, with some of uh, my PhD students we were dealing with the mechanical properties of meteorites. In particular, we have been publishing a paper in Astrophysical Journal just describing uh, the properties of uh, this Chelyabinsk asteroid. Mm -hmm. As uh, well, my colleagues were just uh, talking about recently, in five minutes ago, just it's very, very difficult to find coherent asteroids. But the reason, uh, in fact, is that those asteroids that are close, uh, 
really approaching to Earth are really uh, compacted by impacts. We can see in here the, the two classical lithologies of highly shock ordinary chondrites. The ordinary chondrites represent about 90% per, of the bodies that are reaching the Earth, uh, producing meteorite falls and reaching the ground as ordinary chondrites. Okay. And this is the, the typical clear lithology that we observe for these meteorites. While we have here a shock vein and a very dark uh, material in here, that this consequence of the um, shock waves that are penetrating mm -hmm. these bodies as consequence of the large impacts okay. that fragment this lap these asteroids in the in the main asteroid belt and then the small objects of the size of the Chelyabins Thank you, like, Joseph. Uh, 20 I'm sorry meters, to, for example, sorry, produce. Joseph, to interrupt you, but yes. uh, sorry to interrupt you. But John Luca is now at his station. You know, when it comes to survey, we have to have good timing. So quickly over to John Luca. Thank you again, and we are ready again to look up for asteroids. And now we move at far east because now we are welcoming uh, Dr. Seitaro Urakawa, part of the Japan Space Guard Association. So welcome here, uh, Seitaro. Thank you very much for your availability. Uh, hello, uh, I am very glad to join the, such a great event after the day. Uh, happy after the day. How is your observing going, Seitaro? Hmm? Sorry? How is your observing going? Are you... Uh, uh, today is, uh, it's, it's cloudy in Japan, so oh. there we cannot uh, <laughs> observe the, any asteroid. So it looks like that asteroids knew today was asteroid day. For some reason, they decided to stay behind the clouds, even in, in Hawaii with pan stars. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you have? Yeah, so the, if, if uh, it's fine, uh, I try to uh, observe asteroid uh, 2017 MC1. Yes. Mm. The one because just... it's a very bright asteroid, so the, I try to get the right fabricator. Yes, I saw, I saw that this one right now is less than three lunar distances far from us. So it is a very interesting mm -hmm. object. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that later we will have a chance or the clouds are very strong, so nothing to do tonight for you? Yeah, it's very severe, uh, severe because the June and the July is uh, 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 it's a rainy season in Japan. So the weather forecast... Uh, mm, don't say that. Uh, don't say the good news. <laughs> uh, from what from what observatory are you observing now? We are just curious to know. Oh, sorry. Hmm? What observatory is in which observatory are you right now? Ah, the, my observatory is the Bisei Space Guard Center. The, it is uh, my observatory has a 1.0 meter telescope. Uh, so the hmm, about so the every day uh, we try to uh, follow up observation to NWO. Yes, I know. I have read many times mm. the Bisse name, so I know how active <laughs> you are there. And really, we, we we will be in touch with you again, but we will keep in finger crossed just to hope that for some reason <laughs> to celebrate this day, the clouds will leave Japan free, and you can show us some flying rocks. So thank you, <coughs> thank you, Seitaro, and see you later. Keep up, keep looking up. Thank you very much.